over 100 years of horse racing history and your home for what's happening today is Tommy Walski's Sport of Kings. Today we have a very special program for you. This is our 300th show in the history of the Sport of Kings. Tommy's going to review some of his favorite shows in the 16 years of Hossin' Around. The Sport of Kings is the longest continuous running television show dedicated to covering horse racing. And now here he is, BC's ambassador to the world of horse racing, Mr. Tommy Walsh. In 1998, we won the first of our two Sovereign Awards with a feature on how to become a jockey. At that time, we went to the barn of Frank Barraby, a former rider. We asked Frank, would he be kind enough to guide us through the process? If they want to work, if they really want to work, I sure don't mind helping them. They're just a couple of young people that Jeff really, he wants to become a race rider or that, an apprentice, you know. And the same with like Roxanne, she just really, she came to me and wanted to be, you know, a good gallop girl. But now, I know in the back of her mind, she's never really said to me, but she wouldn't mind riding, riding too, you know. In five years, if things go right, I see myself here at Hastings Park, hopefully as leading rider. And it's dreams, it's, it really is. And they want, they want to see these dreams come true, so we're sure gonna see if, they, if it can happen. If things go right, I see myself right here, um, hopefully in the top three percentile jockeys, um, making a name for myself. Yes, if things go right, the sky's the limit. It's like a, like a young horse or anything else. I just kind of go by how they're coming. You don't want to, you know, you can't set no deadlines. Like, like a Jeff, he said to me, well, I've only got so long to do this or that. And I said, not if you're with me, you don't, because I'll decide when you're, when you're ready, you know. When you're that young, like, holy God, <laughs> a little while seems like eternity. But once you get, like, our age, Tom, then you realize how short a time that was. The other day, I yelled at Jeff about something. He said, he said, you're always yelling at me. <laughs> Patty says, get used to it. He'll be yelling at you for 10 years. <laughs> now, as far as those two hopeful riders, Jeff Birmingham, he went south and become a top rider in the U.S. And as far as Roxy, she worked with Frank as an exercise person until this year and is now working outside of the industry. Now, we're taking it back to the year 1997. We're gonna look at former NHL goalie and horseman Gary Suitcase Smith as he proved that not only does he love horses, he loves the sport of kings. Uh, they say that uh, to be a goaltender, yeah, it's uh, 75% uh, mental and you got to be 25% mental to play it. The trainer has uh, pretty well liked the coach and uh, he gets them, he puts it into their mindset of what he wants of them and uh, horses are usually very smart. Uh, they don't have hangovers like a lot of the <laughs> hockey players do and uh, they, uh, they show up for work every day, not like some of these athletes that uh, uh, pick and choose when they're going to show up. And uh, the coach gets it all together, and basically they have the mindset of a, of a professional athlete. You, you get as close as you possibly can, and then uh, it's just the competition is there, and it's something that I guess maybe when you get older you don't have that competition anymore because you grew up with it when you're playing, but you can't play anymore, so you need the competition, and then to have the horses, that's as close as you can get to it. These horses you just almost figure like are part of your family, so if I was ever fortunate enough to have uh, a son or a daughter, uh, you know, play sports. I go watch my daughter play baseball, and it's the same feeling uh, uh, out of uh, you know the races and uh, to watch your kids play and do well. Um, there's a finality of it at the winning when they cross at the race when they cross that finish line, and I don't mind letting out the odd holler if I've uh, if uh, one of the horses that uh, I'm backing and that I'm hoping for uh, has won the race, and, and I'm, I'm happy for them and. Also, I probably have a few bucks in my pocket over it. <laughs> in 2002, we had to visit the set of the popular television show, Da Vinci's Inquest. It was there that we learned, hey, this cast and crew, they love horses, but they also love Hastings Race Course. I'm going to find a game as good as this. It's awesome, horse racing game. 
But once you, once, I find once I've owned them, the whole betting thing becomes kind of meaningless. I can't even concentrate on it. This game's way better. I mean, a $3,200 claimer can bring tears to my eyes. Good luck with an Oscar or something. I wouldn't give a shit. Working on the racetrack is uh, the best thing you can do for a rider because it learns you how to, uh, teaches you how to uh, initially work for no money and uh, put all your hopes on one day that the right horse is going to come in. Da Vinci's Inquest has been uh, the horse, so uh, for me, it's uh, the big horse has sort of come in. I'm very happy with it and uh, I'm working here. It's like a great job. It's the same, it's the same amount of work whether you're uh, prepping a horse, win or lose, as it is uh, prepping a good script or a bad script or anything you know, like that. It's the same kind of thing, yeah. Most people, you know, realistically, they're not here because they're thinking they're going to get wealthy from it. It's just a glory, it's an attraction, it's, it's the constant challenge, and I think show business is that way, too. Some people aren't suited to it because they can't take the, uh, you know, being out of work all yeah. the time. They can't take, you know, having to reapply for jobs and be constantly on that, on that border, but you get used to it. So we, when you have a, a relationship with disappointment, yeah. I think you, you, you learn how to, how to shoulder you know, like if you, you, you're on a favorite and it come, you know, and you, you, know, you blow up on it and it doesn't run his race and everybody's on you, you know, you got to figure, figure a way to shrug it off to yeah. get on the next horse. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know if there's any athlete that I, re I, I uh, respect more than the jockeys. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're kind of like boxers. Yeah, exactly. The like fitness boxers. and, you know, the strategies and the professionalism and all that. It's like old world, you know. I mean, jockeys are still Mr. So-and-so and Mr. Yeah. So-and-so. 16 years, wow, congratulations, Sport of Kings. Here's to 16 more. Don't go away, the Sport of Kings will be right back. Uh, happy to congratulate the Sport of Kings. Uh, 16 years of excellence covering racing, so it's outstanding. It was in 2004 when we met horse owner Greg Pitt. Greg was not only a wonderful advocate for the sport, but he also was an advocate, a strong advocate for the disabled. Greg was so full of life that we said to ourselves, you know what, we have to take our cameras and we have to film this fellow. I've been involved in disability issues for uh, almost 30 years. I was in a car accident in the 70s. I flew 80 feet out of a convertible. Uh, in an accident in uh, Turkey Point, Ontario, a little community by uh, Lake Erie. And I broke my back and I'm a T4-5 paraplegal. Even uh, pre-injury, I, I rode horses. Um, Post-injury, I went to the track a lot. I started researching it quite extensively and I thought, yeah, this is something I've always wanted to get into for a long time. And I enjoy the track. He's very able, especially uh, considering he's in a wheelchair. He's, uh, he's a very upbeat, positive person and, and handles himself very well. Yeah, he's a real inspiration. That's an excitement and it's not for the faint of heart. You don't want to just whistle in and buy a horse. But um, you, want to, uh, you, you, you want to take your time, but you're meeting a group of people, a very intriguing group of people, who are very respectful of each other. And, and very mindful of each other, very mindful of what, what you, each other's needs are. And um, it's a fascinating community. And it's a community from, from standing back that people sometimes view a suspicion or a wary eye. But it's, it's not like that at all. It's a very friendly, open uh, community. Everybody always says hi. Everybody always asks if you need a hand. It's, it's a very open and caring community, and it is a community within a community. And they interact, and it makes the system work, which when you think about it, is phenomenal. And that's what, that's what makes, the horses make horse racing, but the people end up making the horses. And, and so you've got these two things converging, and they're both phenomenal. So my last word is, is you get the excitement of the people, and you get the excitement of the horses, and then you add in the excitement of the gamblers and the people at the track, and you can't beat it. There's buying a hockey team. Right now. During our 16 years of covering the sport at Kings, we had a chance to watch many a young rider get his chance here at Hastings Racecourse. Among them was Justin Stein. We were there when Stein rode his first race and had his first victory. Stein later went on to be one of the top riders in all of Canada. Justin. I didn't think that I could actually ride 
these kind of horses. I just thought they'd be too much for me, too much to handle. I didn't want to come out here and gallop horses on the track and be in anyone's way and make anyone upset or anything like that. And uh, so I was really careful and cautious and everyone was really, really welcoming here. It was, uh, it was really nice actually. It was, everyone was really supportive towards me and helped me out a lot and gave me good advice. Came into the jocks room for the first time and it was a great honor. Just, uh, I felt really lucky to be in there and uh, felt lucky that I'd uh, got to be, I got to start as soon as I did. I didn't know if I'd be able to ride this year or not even. And Justin quickly picked up mounts and within a week, the big moment had arrived. Right there is my Irish son. Here's Maine stating in the center of the track, Capriya's at the rail. My Irish son, Maine stating from the outside. They'll hit the fire and be a tight finish. Oh, I couldn't believe it. It was, uh, it was pretty amazing. The horse, we ran a little bit differently and I just tucked in behind and just kept up to everyone else and uh, had lots of horse left at the end. When I come across the finish line, I didn't know if I had won or not, but I gave a little wave just because just it felt like I might have, so uh, it was a lot of fun. felt great. This is, uh, this is one of the biggest things I've done in my life so far, and uh, I hope to do it for a lot longer. It was back in 1996 we had the privilege of doing a feature on former jockey, now valid at Hastings Racecourse, Jerry Brownell. It was an extremely emotional piece because Bronny was suffering with cancer. But because of his positive attitude, Bronny did something unique. He came to us and he said, you guys mind filming this because I think it would be a good story because I am going to beat this disease. We listened to him. 11 years later, Bronny still working in the jocks room, cancer free. We did love doing this piece. When I found out I had this cancer, as soon as I talked to, <laughs> soon as I talked to Dr. Murray, and he told me what he was going to do, and I said, well, can we postpone this until the, another week because I got to finish my, my bowling. I've been bowling all, all winter, and uh, we went into the finals. He, all he said, well, this is cancer. And I said, well, okay, what the heck? Let's get on with it. Let's make the appointment. So um, that was it after I got renewal, and I understood it more. And then when I talked to the Dr. Murray and the nurses, I felt quite comfortable that, you know, and then the first day I came in, I didn't know what to really expect. And I was quite nervous. And uh, I never got sick at all the, the first day, and I had both bags the first shot. And, and then even the next day I was expecting it, and you know, everything was fine. So I said, well, this ain't as bad as, you know, as I thought it was going to be, so. I feel good about being able to go to someone and tell them that they've got a disease that we can actually do something about because uh, it is a cancer where the treatment results are usually extremely good. Nothing's ever a home run, but nevertheless, the odds are very excellent that the treatment will do what we want it to do. Well, I think, you know, in this circumstance, Brownie was concerned about the nature of the treatments, that it might be a very difficult treatment. But I think the way things have gone, the treatment is working as well as could be expected, and the side effects are, are manageable. He has side effects, but they're manageable. And so overall, things have gone well, and it's in large measure because of him being able to soldier on with it. He can't wait to get back and say hi to the guys, just even if it's while I go to a race, he's back to say hello, and then he likes to go in the mornings and visit them as soon as he can, even before he can go to work. When I'm done all this, I'm going to go back to Razor. I'll be back. Hi, I'm Manny Sabrell, and I'd like to congratulate the Sport of Kings on 16 years of excellence in covering horse racing. It's a knockout of a show. Don't go away. The Sport of Kings will be right back. I'd like to congratulate the Sport of Kings on uh, 16 years of covering uh, horse racing. It was back in the year 2000 and we had the opportunity to catch up with Hall of Fame jockey Sandy Hawley. Hawley was here on behalf of Woodbine Racetrack to do some goodwill for both racetracks Hastings and Woodbine. It also gave us a chance to learn a lot more about the successful recovery that Sandy had from melanoma cancer. A very enlightening feature. I was going around the barn one morning and I hadn't even rode a race yet. I remember one of the trainers saying, hey, Jock, how you doing this morning? I went, holy cow, they called me Jock. What a, what a great thrill. 20 years ago, I was here at uh, Hastings Park, 
And uh, I'll tell you what, I remember coming in here just the other day, and as soon as I walked in the paddock, I went, oh yeah, I remember this place well now. And there's a lot of guys in the drop room that I met back then that I remembered, and they remembered me. It was good to talk about old times. Sandy, how did you play today? Uh, I think I shot a 92. But uh, first four holes, I started off with four sixes. Double bogey, double bogey. Double. People don't realize it, but it's, it's like a little family in there. I know when you get on the racetrack, it's kind of every man for himself. It's dangerous out there, so you try and protect one another. But once you get back to the jocks room, you know, it's we had a lot of fun in there, played a lot of pranks on one another, and it was like a happy family. Now, that's one of the things I miss about riding. Well, anytime you can help anybody that's uh, got cancer, the same as myself. I, I know when I had the cancer, I didn't know anybody that had it, and I was very scared. You know, I never knew anybody that survived, and I thought my life was over. I, I, thought, uh, I thought I was toast. Uh, went to uh, the uh, oncologist, he started me off on some vaccine shots, which I think changed my diet also. I'm vegetarian now, and I, between, I think between changing my diet and the oncologist with his vaccine shots, I think has helped save my life. But, uh, you know, it's, it's very scary when you're going through something like that by yourself. And I realize that and anytime anybody calls me or, or wants uh, any information on cancer or any help I can give, you know, I'm, I'm right there 100% to give it because I know when I was going through it myself, I'd like to have had somebody that went through the same thing as me. In 1996, we did something that had never been done before. We took our cameras to the Stewart's office here at Hastings Racecourse. We met with them, that would be the Stewart's, and three jockeys as they watched and reviewed a possible racing infraction. This was cool. I was kind of told to take back off of the speed, and uh, <clears throat> so when Sam, or when Jake broke strong like that, uh, I was hoping that he had enough horse to kind of just clear me. And as it was, he just didn't quite clear me. And as much as uh, Davey was shouting and screaming for help, I couldn't really give him much of a shot because it was uh, uh, it was getting a little tight in there for him. I actually thought I had him had him cleared when I started to drop over. And that's that when all the screaming started. You can you can see me look back and and you know I just didn't realize that there's a guy still in on the fence. In your blind spot there? Yeah, you know he was right. He was kind of on the flank of uh, of Danny here. And then you can see Davey start to take and hold here. He could see what was going to happen, but I couldn't really see him. And I actually thought I had Danny clear when I started to drop over. I, you can see now on the films that I didn't. But no, you had lots of lots of horse away from the gate, Jake. Yeah, I kind of took a hold of took a hold of her a little too much to try to slow down the pace before I actually got my position. Well, I think he should have, uh, without question, uh, given the boys on the inside a little bit more room. He had all the horse. Just to roll right on by there. He could have kept riding. If he'd have kept riding, he'd have been all right. right. He, he, he chose to slow, slow it down too early. The thing about keeping riding, I mean, he can set the pace he wants to set, but he's still responsible to leave room for the fellas that are inside. I mean, if if he if he if he only had the one inside of him, he could have slowed it down that much. He didn't even know Dave was there, and uh, that's just. That's just not enough. That's not enough effort on his part. He's got to know where the other guys are. Well, he had one guy on the inside of him, regardless of where Dave is. is he uh, come down far more than he should have should have come down. He looked back. He could see uh, Danny on the inside of him. He didn't even give Danny a break. Uh, he had lots of horse. The horse isn't lugging in on him or anything. He could have just rolled right on by. So I can't uh, I can't really help him on this. I I think he. Uh, should um, maybe great. take the, maybe take the three days. Congratulations to the Sport of Kings for 16 years of, of service to the horse racing world. Don't go away. The Sport of Kings will be right back. Three hundred shows. That's good in the TV business any day, and in the horse business, you're with us all the time. Let's do 300 more. In 2001, we won our second Sovereign Award with a piece on Spud O'Connor, who after learning how to cope with his demons, went on to become a successful trainer at Hastings. Actually, Spud was so candid with the piece, we probably should have gave him half the Sovereign It hasn't been easy. You know, there's been times where I've, I've wanted to throw my arms in the air, and, uh, but I think, uh, 
the, the people in Winners Foundation like Ralph Therese and Brian McAfee and, and Bill Turner, and, uh, there's a good support network here, which helps, you know. And there's a, at least a dozen or so guys that are sober on the backside today because of the Winners Foundation. My mom and my brother have really stood by me, you know. Well, he's, and, he's uh, Dad did a lot for racing at BC. He's in the Hall of Fame here. You know what he used to say to me? Brian, you worry about things you can't do nothing about. And I have a tendency to worry about things I can't, I can't control. He says, just do your job and, and do the groundwork and, and things will turn out if they're supposed to. You know? That was one of his favorite sayings, there ain't no hell for a high stepper. It was a pretty emotional couple of weeks, like the horse win on Father's Day. And three days later, I got my five-year chip for being sober. And two weeks later, he went uh, win again in an optional allowance. And I wanted to run him one more time and, because we were getting kind of slow in the dough. And, and, and Dad always says, if you're running a horse because you're broke, you probably shouldn't. So I sent him home. In 1993, our second year of doing the Sporty Kings, we had the opportunity to visit with Hall of Fame jockey and trainer Johnny Longden. And what Longden brought to the table was he enjoyed seeing his close old friends that he hadn't seen in a while. Plus, man, did John love talking to the people. John, how have riders changed in the last, since you've been riding? Any special way? No, I, not exactly. The, we, we get a, 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 more of a, a riders from other countries over here now. I don't know why we don't develop riders, uh, American or Canadian riders, like we used to. Thank God. That's what the cane. <laughs> yeah. You've never been that light in your life, John. No, I couldn't do that in college. I know. That's a good outfit. Hello, John. How are you? Good, how are you? Fine. Good, good to see you. Uh, Hi. How are you? How you doing? You good. That's good. Do you really enjoy going into the jocks and visiting your old, your old friends, it looks like? <laughs> I do, I do. We had a great reunion yesterday at Hollywood Park. All the old riders, they invited them there, and we had a great time. And I like to see them all. Shoemaker was there, and, and it was a great day yesterday. And it's a great pleasure for me to come here uh, with Jack Diamond, you know. he's a good friend, and he's done so much for racing. And it's a pleasure that I can come up here. The Bay Circuit in the interior has always drawn a keen interest for those of us working with the sport of kings. And it was for this reason we took our cameras up to the interior to give you a first-hand look at what goes on with this unique form of horse racing. To do this, we asked former Hastings Park jockey Ron Billadu, and he gave us what we would call a royal tour. Uh, but this is uh, what I'll drive to work today. I kind of like to think I can win on every horse I ride, Tom. You know, I mean, if I didn't think that, um, I shouldn't be on it. I don't think there's anything guaranteed in this business, and anybody that does is a fool because uh, so many things can happen during a course of a race. It gets pretty hot in the jocks room. Some of the, you know, in this heat, the riders, we sometimes have to blow a little steam off, you know, because of the heat. and. You kind of later on in the day, you you know you make up, you know sorry for whatever hap for whatever reason. But it, it does kind of bother you when it's this hot. You do get your tempers get a little short. I I like to ride horses. I don't want to go sit in a bench. It's like going to a baseball game. You know you don't go play baseball and sit in the bench. You like to go and play. On our last segment for today, we're taking it back to the year 1992 for our first segment. This is where we took our cameras to the starting gate. We did something that was never done before, we believe, on television. We actually went into the starting gate, and this is what we all watched back in 1992. When it comes to danger on the racetrack, jockeys have probably the highest rate of danger here. But the people that are underrated and misunderstood quite often are the assistant starters. So what we're going to do is take you into the starting gate, let you know what goes through two jocks' minds. 
One of them is Danny Brock. I'll introduce you to Danny to my left. This is Cowboy. He's from the Frank Barbie barn. Naturally, he's not a thoroughbred. He's a pony. We've used him before in doing a scene like this. And he's perfect for what we want to show you, the audience. All right, Cowboy, let's take the stick out of our pocket. OK. Now, as you can see, Joe's got a hole in it. Make sure my horse doesn't act up in it. But the main thing is we want to make sure that we have our helmet. This is something we don't do. We make sure the helmet strap is hooked up for safety reasons. So we always tell the jock when they leave the paddock, make sure your strap is on. Next thing you do is make sure your goggles are down. Because if they're not down, then you're in trouble. Now, Joe has got me. He's looking over to make sure Danny's all right. And sometimes what will happen is these horses will get to play. And Joe, what happens when they do get to play? That, like he'll want to bite your horse. I just got just keep his head pushed over so he can't they can't get to fight with each other, biting or grabbing or it's, you know a lot of they do a lot of that biting and grabbing thing. They like that. Main principle is we want to make sure that they're alert and that they are going to break straight. And this is a big part of the assistant starter and the jock. So my job is shift a bit, and we're ready to roll. So and boom, we're gone. Well, that's it for this special edition of the Sport of Kings, where we celebrated 16 seasons, 300 shows of being your eyes and ears to the world of horse racing, right here in British Columbia. A couple of things to leave you with, this all can be made possible. This all was made possible thanks to our sponsors, Horsemen, and most of all, you out there. Remember, keep it straight, or we are going to get you on that final turn. 